Well, good morning to you. I see we have a few that are tuning in. We'll wait just another minute or two and then we'll get started. Those who are currently viewing live, feel free to say hi there in the chat line. Also, you'll be finding these lyrics for the songs will appear in the chat line. Also, if you have some prayer requests today, feel free to put those in the chat line. Tyler, it says I can bring you on camera. Would you like me to do that? <laughs> Hi, Claudia. Tyler said he'll pass on coming on camera. Okay. Karen, Russell, Kathleen. We'll start in just a second. If you're having any audio issues, just go ahead and let us know now. We'll try to fix those. <clears throat> Hi, Gary, Sue Ann, children. So Tyler is putting up the words there, and you can see them for our first song. We just want to welcome you, first of all. Um, and if you're wondering, why are we watching this online <coughs> instead of meeting together? Well, we had a kind of a strange gathering of events, and one was we had quite a bit of sickness. And we also have some COVID sickness. And we also have some folks who had planned to be gone who are pretty key to our production of uh, streaming and Sunday morning worship. So with all that mixed together, <coughs> excuse me, with all that mixed together, it just seemed like maybe this would be a good week to take one week off from meeting in face to face, use the technology that we know how to use from oh I don't know a year and a half or three quarters ago, and so we will. And so we invite you to just join in today, send your encouragements and your prayer requests via the chat line, and also we'll be singing together as well as sharing from the Word. So I'm uh, looking over here, we'll see if there's anything else. Oh, yes, Sue Ann, good morning to you. Yeah. So uh, if you have any other things, um, go ahead and send it through the chat line. If it's something that's not working, feel free to text Kay's phone. Uh, that will work as well. So, All right. I think it's be a good time to uh, start with a song, and then we'll... Uh, See if any prayer requests have come in since then. And Tyler's got the lyrics there. You can see them by clicking on his uh, chat contribution there. So, here I am to worship. And I pray that's what we're really here for. As we give worth to God. Now, Kay and I have sang this song many times over many years. And I think Mr. Tim Hughes the, uh, from, I think, the UK has done a wonderful job of bringing... That's a vehicle to come to a place of thinking of God in the right way as we give work to Him. Now, you probably have heard this story a few times from us. There was a time where Kay and I were asked to sing in many, many years ago in another church, and, and we were just fine with that. And then also we were asked, would you sing and play during the offering? And we said, well, we're, we're fine. Oh, excuse me. Communion. Yes, thank you. Communion. And we were fine with that. And then we sang, started singing, and we noticed that the communion was meaningful. 
uh, but conducted, conducted a little different than what we uh, normally have. And so, as the pastor had communion and we were singing, we sang through the first verse and I sang the second, what have you, we realized that the communion wasn't the whole congregation at once. And so individuals or couples or families would come up to the front of the church and the pastor would have communion with every single one of them, meaning the, each little group. And so now we're running out of verses and we're trying to figure out how to repeat this and how to make it meaningful and um, not sure how to do an instrumental to this just yet. And so anyway, it was kind of a funny story that we, we tend to remember. So. So we'd ask you this morning to consider, even with all that's happening right now, maybe personally or corporately or nationally and globally, is God still worthy of worship in my life? Is He still the one that I can trust to say, I, I give you worth? And you are the one I should follow. Not my own way, not the ways of others, but you. Let's sing together.
this point, we'll go ahead and look to see what prayer requests have come in. Hey, James, how are you doing? Praying, praying for Joella. Yeah, you got it, James. And other prayer requests? If I missed one, I'm sorry for that. I'm looking. Yeah, as you have prayer requests, feel free to send those in. And... We have a few that we could share with you as well. And hi, Wes Goddard, all the way from Paraguay. Look at you. And so we'll say hello to Wes. Uh, eh, I said, how's your rising? So we'll see what he says back. He'll probably say something like, Epuan, Lo Vale Jawa, get up your worthless dog, or something silly. Oh, he hasn't replied yet. Okay, hi, Wes. So any prayer requests? that you have. We'll just uh, watch for this and we'll, we'll put those up. So we'll share a few. One is Joella is currently still in the hospital. And James, uh, elaborate as you will, but has had surgery, uh, has a revision of that surgery again this last week and now is still in recovery. We have multiple folks who are dealing with COVID um, and are seemingly recovering, but others are sick from that or something else. And so Let's pray for Joyce and Dewey and Sue Ann and others who are, are currently ill right now. And Gary is saying his brother Pat is having trouble getting out of Denver, so he can use prayers for his situation to resolve itself. Pat is trying to uh, come down here to visit uh, Gary. And so pray for Pat. Any other prayer requests you might have? We'll continue to pray for Kay's father, uh, Dale. He's making good recovery. He's currently uh, in a rehab hospital. <laughs> Wesley you just heard the greeting. Okay. Other requests for you? Well, we'll watch during our prayer time here. Uh, let's just go to a time of prayer. So as your house is watching this, I pray that you'll we'll come to a place where we can just kind of tune out everything for a moment and just, ex just realize that the God of all creation is listening and hearing you. So Father, we come to you. We acknowledge you and who you are. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy grace in your dealing with us. Father, we thank you for your salvation you have provided through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for the grace that you continually show us. So Father, as we come this morning, maybe with very heavy hearts or very concerned minds or possibly finding restoration and walking and and enjoying what all you have for us. Lord, wherever we are, we acknowledge this. You are the one in charge of all. You are in heaven. You are holy. Even your name is a holy thing, even though it's used so unholy by some. Lord, we ask for the things that we know to ask. We ask for healing for Joella. We ask for continued favor in Wes's ministries down in Paraguay. We ask for Pat to be able to find his way uh, to where he's going. We pray for those who are finding themselves ill this week and we're finding the COVID is spreading quickly and rapidly. We pray for each one of those families with the challenges this, this brings. And we, Lord, we ask for what we know to, which is healing. So we'll ask for healing for everyone. And we'll ask for protection for each one as well. And we'll ask for peace for all. Lord, we ask that your will be done in by us as you gather and send us out that we would be listening to you by obeying your word, hearing the Holy Spirit, and, and doing your will just as it's done in heaven at all times. Lord, we ask for the things we need. 
We ask for the, the daily bread, if you will, of what we need. Lord, we ask for protection from disease as currently is a problem as well as any other problem. But we ask for protection from ourselves. That we would find ways to, to live for you and not live our way and find ourselves being sinful. So Lord, we take this and we acknowledge that you are the God who is making all things right. And we are here on this earth for this time. And Lord, I thank you for the experience of what you're doing in each life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome Merlin <coughs> and Deb. We'd like to sing some more with you, and so Tyler will throw up some lyrics here, and that will be, um, Everywhere I Go. <clears throat> So many, many have heard the story before as Kay and I were at a worship conference and we probably heard this song, I would assume, but there was a worship leader there uh, named Tim Timmons, who's one of the authors of the song, and, and he just shared a very powerful testimony in a very, I don't know how to say it, just a very natural, normal way of his struggle, which was with inoperable brain cancer. It was very moving, and he was also really good at teaching people songs that they didn't know uh, right there. He could start off with a song, and he'd have you singing it and worshiping the Lord with it. And then we had a, a chance to be traveling, and um, we met him. And he, he, how do you approach that? You know, because I really wanted to know how he was doing, and, and I just said something like, how is your health? And he said, uh, what was it? Uh, I got up every morning, <laughs> and I think the indication is he still has cancer, and it's still inoperable, but here he is, even some years down the road, he's still going. And I thought, what an attitude, that he didn't let that be the defeating factor. He says, as his song will say, everywhere I go. So let's sing together. Everywhere I go, on this road high and low, where I go, I go.
song beautiful one when we think about that, that as if it wasn't the way that we tend to see it sometimes on earth is this is hard it's we are we are in a relationship with the god of all creation the one who's made everything let's sing together beautiful one <laughs> As we continue in singing, let's just acknowledge what a good God that we serve and know. As today in the sermon, we'll talk about husbands and wives. And I think as we also look to the term father, know it's so much more than even what earthly fathers in their best intentions could even accomplish. So let's go sing of a good, good father.
accept who we are and we take that as the privilege and the exalted place that you have loved us uh, in, in everything that we do and say you are present to know how to help and how to care for us and we thank you for your your purity and your holiness that there's no shadows or turning within you so we thank you in Jesus name amen if you have your Bibles, we're continuing our series in Ephesians 5. Now, we've been in Ephesians for quite some time now. And we're headed to uh, a passage where Paul has been discussing submission. And he, he basically just puts it out there that we should submit ourselves one to another. Now, that word submit tends to cause uh, some concerns, as you well know. And so we're going to look at that a little bit. Now, the word he's referring to is uh, hupotasso, 
And this is a, a word that was used in military settings. And some of us have, who served in the military have had our fair share of hupotasso, meaning we've served in the place that we were. And so it also had a meaning outside of the military or a civilian use with someone choosing to serve in an area. And so this, when you hear that word, start thinking about that. So let's just go ahead and read the passage today. And we'll start with Ephesians 5, 21. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version today. <coughs> Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so this is what Paul is saying. He said, hey, Folks, submit to one another. It's that word. Hupotasso. Um, saying, serve in that area. Be a part of this mission. And so, he says, not to do it because you're downtrodden, <laughs> but because you understand what God is doing. And that he has a mission in, li in our lives, and he is reconciling humankind back to him. And by submitting to one another in the areas that we serve in the areas that we lead, we can be showing a reverence for him and what he's doing. So by doing that, we're part of the mission. And so when you think of the word submitting, you think of submission, usually a negative term anymore, but also it is, think of, I am fitting into the area that God has called me to be. So let's continue here with wives and husbands. So he'll give three examples here of submission. So he says, submit yourselves to each other out of reverence for Christ. Now let me give you three examples. One will be husbands and wives. The next will be parents and children. And then it will be uh, masters and slaves, or in our case, uh, employees and bosses. But here it is, uh, verse 22. And I'll just go ahead and read through this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And so, as you probably have figured out, this is one of those landmines of a passage that can... <clears throat> cause a lot of concern of what does this mean, what didn't it mean. So we're going to walk through that today. So just understanding, and I'll just read to you um, when I was doing some study on this word of submission, here it is. Uh, this is from, a, I believe, a lexicon. It says, the word was a Greek military term meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming the responsibility, and carrying a burden. And so, many of us lead in our life, <clears throat> but I can say almost all of us also submit in our life. And so, it's not that it's a class of people, it's a mission that we're on. So, I want to use that word, hupotasso, uh, and we're going to go back to Luke chapter 2. So, go ahead and turn there if you would. We're going to see a use of the word. Now, I want to go ahead and read the story so we kind of get the full context of it. Because sometimes I think when you hear that word submit, we think somehow that that makes us downtrodden. And in this case, uh, as he says, wives submit to your husband, it, 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 some might even consider that it's saying, well, you're downtrodden by your husband. Well, we're going to look at that term, and we're going to see how it's used in Scripture. We'll let the Scriptures do the preaching today, because they're going to be a lot better than I am. So I assume you're in Luke 2 now. We're in chap excuse me, verse 41. Now, we just came out of a Christmas season, and we've been studying in Luke 2, and we pretty much just left off about where this starts. And so here is Jesus, who is now a boy. No longer the infant, he is a boy. And they would make these trips or pilgrimages down to Jerusalem for certain Jewish religious rites. And that's what's happened here. 
And so we don't know exactly how old he is, but he's certainly walking, talking, moving around, doing his thing, uh, expressing himself, listening. And so I you know, would guess he's, I would assume he's in that 8 to 12 range, somewhere in there. And so here he is, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year. So Mary and Joseph, Jesus, and as there were other children in the family, they would have went, I assume. Now his parents were, went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12, okay, there we have the age, all right. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group that they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. Okay, now Jerusalem is a very large city. And these folks are coming down from Galilee. And they're coming with a group. And they head back up to Galilee. And where's Jesus? Well, they figure he's with somebody else in our group. And we find out he's not. And so they head back down there. You can imagine this, this frantic feeling in their hearts that, where is our son? After, verse 46, after three days, okay, I would say, um, if you've lost any child that was under your care for three minutes in a Walmart, uh, you know the terror. And so you can imagine three days in a very, very large city that would have been full of all kinds of folks but after three days. So start thinking of the angst or the anxiousness that would be going on inside them to know that here they have been searching for three days. I mean, we don't know about the search. We can guess how it went down, how one of them probably found somebody at the temple who, who they could trust and say, hey, um, can you go and look for him? And can you watch for him? And you can just see how this would go down. So. They find him. Now, much of the time when you find a lost child, uh, you're, you're thinking maybe of all the anxious thoughts you had and how could they do this to me and, and what have you, but you also are very glad you found him. Let's go ahead and join back with him. After three days, they found him in the temple. Huh. So he's sitting there in that place of worship. Now, it's interesting, he's not just hanging out there or playing hopscotch or doing whatever kids would do, he's sitting with, he's sitting among the teachers. And, and, you know, we don't know all their ages, but these, they certainly weren't 12. And we can see these wise men who were teaching, and they are, he is sitting among them. Now, if he's 12, it, it, I'm wondering if he's even had his bat mitzvah, he's even considered uh, an adult according to the Jewish law. Here he is, but he's sitting among them. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. I'm sure for a couple of reasons. One, we found him. Oh, and two, he's sitting among the teachers. And they're not running him off. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Jesus, you know what we've been through. Now his answer is absolutely truthful. And is in no way callous, because that's not his nature. Or dismissive. He's telling the truth. He said, And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So he gives the answer and explains, this is where I should be. But mom and dad have a different response. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Okay, so here it is. You've seen the standoff. Not that this is a, a sinful standoff at all. They've said, why have you done this? He goes, well, this is where I should be. Like, what? But notice what Jesus does. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth 
and was submissive to them. And there's our word, hupotasso. The God of all creation in a human flesh is greeted by his parents saying, well, why did you do this? And he says, this is where I should be. But notice, it, he goes back with them and we get just a little glimpse of his life. He submitted to them. He listened to what they wanted him to do. Not that he had done anything wrong or really they had done anything wrong. So notice this. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was, here's our word for today, submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Mary would remember these things. And I'm sure a lot of clarity would come over the years before and after his death and resurrection. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature. Yeah, he physically grew. And in favor with God and man. Wouldn't it be fun to have a son or a friend named Jesus who wasn't just the name Jesus, a common Jewish name. He was sinless and never sinned. We'll see the word used again. If you'd like, you can go to 1 Peter chapter 3. So what you're seeing is the word here is being used by Jesus as, this is where I am right now. This is, this. and he submitted to them. Now let's look at Peter. He's actually talking uh, about the same subject, but he puts an interesting spin on it. He's going to talk about wives be subject to your husbands for reason of testimony. Same word. Likewise, First uh, Peter chapter three, verse one. Likewise, wives, be subject, upotasso, to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without the word by the conduct of their wives, when they see you respectful of your conduct. Wow, that's an amazing thing Peter is sharing. Wives, accept the mission with your husband, even if he isn't godly. Now, a couple caveats here. No husband should be demanding or commanding or expecting his wife to do something sinful, and she should have to obey that. But on the other hand, he's saying by accepting the mission of wives, actually on a different mission which is witnessing and possibly bringing this man to salvation because of he'll see your pure life so let's go back now to Ephesians 5 21 or 5 22 we see it again wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, there's a couple wrong interpretations that will come from this. And let's just hit a number one. Wrong interpretation. Wife, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Now, the key there, obviously, is your own husband. Um, I have no more leadership over other women um, because they're not my wife. Where Kay and I are accepting the missions of husband and wife, and there are times that I will be leading. And there's times that I am listening, and there's times I'm learning. But she accepts the mission of submission. Now, if you're not sure, I'm just making it up. There she is. She can tell you for herself. She's still smiling. She doesn't have a, a, a rolling pin or frying pan ready to go. So, okay, I think we're all right. Okay. So. And okay. so, this is not one better than another but each one in a different mission. So wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now here's the wrong interpretation. Uh, submit to your husband, wrong interpretation now. Submit to your husband as if he were God. Well, that's what it says, right? Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That is so wrong. And any man who would force that issue is just being petty and a tyrant. That is not what it's saying at all. That, well, you should submit to God, so you ought to be submitting to me. Okay. Understand, we're two people working together, and we'll, we'll look a little more at that relationship here in a moment. But as she is submitting to God, she will be fulfilling that mission. And 
ladies, if you think it's coming down hard on you, wait till next week for guys. And we have a mission that is totally sacrificial. It's like Christ's mission for the church. So, uh, Next, wrong interpretation. Okay, the first one was wrong interpretation. Submit to your husband as if he were God. Wrong. Next, wrong interpretation. Um, if he does what I think the Lord wants, or possibly what I want, then I will submit to him. Wrong. Okay. And First Peter shares with that. And so it can be this. Well, he may be my husband, but he's not, I'm not so sure that, I'm not sure he's doing what the Lord wants, so I don't have to submit to him. Or, I don't think he's, he may be doing that, but he's not doing it the way I want, so I still don't have to submit to him. Both wrong. So, to, to review, wrong interpretation one, submit to your husband as if he were God, wrong. Wrong interpretation two, uh, number two, excuse me. He does, if he does what I think the Lord wants, or possibly what I want, then I'll submit to him. Submission is easy when we are in agreement, isn't it? So in the church, when we're all working towards the same thing, it's easy to submit one to another. And in marriages, when it's all going right and we're, we're, we're in agreement on something, submission is easy. Well, it should be. It's when there's a difference. Or a decision is unpopular, even if it is a good decision. And that's where we have to choose to be in the mission that we are. This is where I am placed. This is who, how I submit. And so, if we're living godly, following God's word, living by the Spirit, submission, in whatever submission it will be, or in the man's case, sacrificial living, it will be much easier. But in conflict, we have to choose... Do I submit to this or not? Now, some of us have served in the military, and so I can think of some of the evolutions I was involved in, these great big things where planes are flying, boats are here, helicopters are there, troops are doing this, I'm on a ship, and my job was whatever was assigned for the day, and I had to do that, and I had to do it well, or it would inhibit what's going on. But in the grand scheme of things, my job was actually a very small part. And there were certainly plenty of people above me that I had to submit to. And so it was an important job, even though it was a part of a very large job. And some of us who have worked in emergency uh, services or public safety, it's the same way. My job might seem small, but it's very important that I submit to my leaders and do that job. Does that mean that I can't ask questions? Of course not. Does that mean that I can't offer ideas? Of course not. And all those things should be happening in a marriage as well. Moving on here. So the key in the wife's submission to her husband, it's to submit to God and accept his or God's mission and then her subset of the mission. Now, now ladies, don't worry. Um, the directives for the husband that are, are coming up uh, is to love his wife with a sacrificial, nurturing love as Christ loves the church. And so it's not this week we're going to beat on the ladies and tell them to start paying attention to their husbands. That's not what it's saying. It's saying submit to your husband. And, and husbands, guess what? You can even give your life for, for your wife as, as Christ did for the church. All right. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And we're in Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. You say, well, why does it have to be that way? Why is it that the husband is the leader and the wife is submitting to him? I think we'll do well to go way back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis 3.16. Now, while you're going there, let me give you some backstory, and you probably know it. Adam and Eve are living in the Garden of Eden. That's perfect. It's beautiful. And, and, every, and they're innocent. 
They don't know anything about sin or anything like that. And no animal eats another animal. They, they, just, they just live off the garden, and the humans do too. And things just grow, and they, they tend them, but it's like a joy of tending them out. Most of my days in the garden growing up were fighting with goat head sambers. Whereas sometimes as a, a grown up, I've done a little gardening, gardening, and when it wasn't just flat out labor, it was actually kind of a joy to just tend it. I think in, in the garden it was that way for Adam and Eve. Well, anyway, this is where they are, and then there is a failure. They're told not to eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they knew not to do it. And they did. And that brought about sin. And that changed everything. And the perfect, innocent Eden that they all lived in is now is it's no longer. We live in an earth that is broken. And it, as the Bible says, moans and groans as a woman in childbirth. It goes through stuff. So let's take a look at what happened after they had sinned against God. So God has pronounced a curse upon the serpent, and we can see what he's referring to, that the seed of the woman, meaning her offspring, would crush his head, and he would bruise his heel, it's referring, I think, referring to Jesus, who will break the authority of Satan. And then he turns to the woman, Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And so yes, uh, some have said that uh, a human female goes through more pain in childbearing than, than the other parts of creation who give birth. And yeah, that's true. Some have even tried to flesh out that it might be saying that I will surely multiply your pain. You say, what are you talking about? Well, notice there's a difference here. I will multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So we know about the physical pain of labor. But I think there might be a, something to be said here that being a mother is very painful at times. To think that you, you take this, this little one from your own body and you raise them and you sacrifice for them. And then sometimes you'll watch them turn from you or rebel against you and, and, or be harmed or hurt or sick. And there's a lot of pain involved. That's not that fathers don't feel pain too. But from my observation, and I'll just leave it at that, there is a, a relationship of mother that involves a, a lot of pain, especially just the sacrifice of living as she cares for her children. So there, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring for children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Okay. Well, that sounds real strong and misogynistic, but it's not saying that. Because the relationship in Eden is no more, where a man and a woman lived in perfect innocence, God would come by and visit with them, that's over. And because of the fall, if you will, these are the things that will happen. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. There will be difficulties between you. Now, you may have a translation that says your desire will be to your husband. So you say, where are you getting that contrary part? Well, that's part of the, the English standard version. It's okay if you have that, because we can see how the word is used here in another passage, very close to this one. So they, they went out, and we'll see more of what happens to Adam here in a bit. But she's told that your desire will be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And I think that's the, the trial of, of men and women, isn't it? In a marriage, do I allow him to rule? And on his end, do I rule properly, which is not in domineering. Or tyrannical displays, it's I will serve this woman with everything I have and meet her. And so a proper husband isn't ruling over his wife, he's giving growth to his wife, he's 
sacrificing for her and caring for her. Let's go take a look at Cain here. Uh, so she has children, Abel and uh, Cain, and we know their story a little bit, how they were to bring sacrifices, and Abel brought the suitable sacrifice from his flock, Cain brought a sacrifice of produce uh, from the fields, and it was not the right sacrifice. Now God's going to speak to him here. He's going to use uh, a similar term here, uh, this, this word of desire. So um, the translation can be, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Here's the word coming up again. And this is why I think it, it's a strong case that it is not just, oh, my desire. It's desire to be contrary with, with my husband. All right. Verse 6 of chapter 4. God is so gracious here. He sees the anger, the sin of Cain at not having his sacrifice uh, accepted because he did not offer the proper sacrifice. But God comes to him and shares some wisdom with him. Here's what happens. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And he would be. With the right sacrifice came. And if you do not do well, here it is. Sin is crouching at the door. I don't know if Cain had really thought what was going to, his next moves, he may have. Maybe God was already knowing that. But God also knew what was, because of who he is, what was coming. And that would be the murder of his brother. But he tells him, he tries to intervene with him, and he says, and if, and if you do not do well, you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Here it is. Here's the word. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Hey. Now we see that word used, and your desire will be to your husband. This is something that is causing a friction, and this is a part of the fall. And the husband himself, instead of, you know, may have the tendency to want to just rule, or, we'll talk more about this next week, cease to function. You see it all the time. Uh, ladies who out of no other options have had to take over and do the husband's job. It's unfortunate. It's sad. And so we'll talk about more about that next week. That he can be a tyrant or he can be the sacrificial leader as Christ was, which is the proper way, or he can just be absent or despondent, so, so to speak. Let's take a look at Adam's leadership here. Because he failed in his leadership, and this is part of the problem. When the serpent came to beguile Eve, Adam went along with this. And so instead of being a good leader and doing what he knew was right, meaning not eat of this fruit, he went along with it. Genesis 2 is where we'll be. We'll just slip, flip back a page there to Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's why we all die. That is part of the curse of, of that sin. Now Adam knew, he and his wife, they lived there, it was wonderful, and this is their world. And so, um, and God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so here comes Eve on the scene. So think about it, Adam lived there, everything was great, he had these animals, he gave names to them, and God could see he's not complete. And so, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I'm sure he could have used the animals to help him in his business. Uh, as a, um, he could have had the giraffe be a scaffolding if he wanted fruit off a high tree. He could have had, and you can just make this up, let your imagination go wild because there was no enmity between him or the animals. They all got along. But God could see Adam needs something more than this. And so here's what happened. Verse 19, now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. 
And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, can you imagine that? He has been with all the animals and, and everything, I mean, just walking around the garden with them and what have you, and there's that, that, that part that's missing, God brings her to him. And here's what he had to say, this at last, it's like there's this, ah, oh, there's something that fits me. I mean, there is a part of me that is missing, and it's here. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And that is how God sees the husband and wife relationship. This wonderful thing, of two people becoming one flesh before him. Now here's the curse upon Adam. <clears throat> Everything was right. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything was right, and she is brought to him. And then the serpent asked Eve, well, has God really said all that? Well, yeah. And, and then, you know, what happened? There was a sin of eating it. She brings a fruit to Adam, and he just does not lead. He goes along with it. And here is what the curse upon him. And to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Adam, I said, don't do it. And because of that, the ground is now cursed. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You think about it, we, we lived life a little different than our ancestors have, um, but life has been very hard, eking a living from the, from the earth. And that is the cause, or is because of the fall and part of the curse uh, upon Adam. And then there's more. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And what a contrast. So a man and a woman who lived perfect before God in this beautiful, innocent place have sinned. They're cast out. There's a curse upon each one of them and upon the earth itself. And they will return to that earth as dead people. Now, God doesn't leave it there. And, and I love that God is a God of redemption, and this is the beginning of his story, and he promises a deliverer, and he delivers on that deliverer, and we look back to the event of Christ coming and living the sinless life and being this proper sacrifice for us, and now is resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. As you follow this, the lesson is really the, the church is to submit to Christ as well. And so, Paul gives us an example. Wives, submit to your husbands. Take on the mission that is set out for you. And then he will go at length. Husbands, lead like Christ leads. So let's finish up here with uh, verse 24 of Ephesians 5. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Oh yeah, I love her. Yeah, she's cute. I like her. She's bone by bone, flesh by flesh. No, no, listen up. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so you've probably heard of the book as well as the concept of love and respect. And so we're, 
Women are to respect their husbands, and husbands are to love their wives, and, and he doesn't feel respected, so he doesn't feel like he should love, and she doesn't feel loved, so she doesn't give respect, and this unfortunate vortex of dysfunction swirls and swirls. But let's start with understanding what Christ is asking here of us. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So next week, uh, we'll cover men and their responsibilities. So men, I ask you to consider this question. Men, are you leading? Are you giving godly leadership? Or are you ignoring the mission? Catch that? Are you actually leading your wife with love, and sacrificial living? Or are you just functioning and or maybe you just figure, well, she'll, she'll take care of it for me. And then we wonder why their wives don't want to submit to husbands. So, these are not easy subjects, they're tough subjects. And they certainly hit literally home with, with all of us. So let's be encouraged that this isn't about dominating women or, or women choosing to submit to their husbands just because he's finally got it right, the way I think it's right. No, it's a relationship that is a beautiful thing God has created. And so let's, let's consider that as we continue in this journey next week. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with hearts of dysfunction at times. We come to you with missing this mark of giving love and respect to each other. I pray, Lord, that we would see and trust in your way and what you're doing in creating the husband and wife relationship. And then we use that to see the relationship of Christ for the church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to uh, close with a song as we sing of the blessing that we have in Christ. So as we say goodbye today, and uh, we'll be sharing, uh, hopefully throughout the week, and Lord willing, I don't see any reason we wouldn't be meeting in person next week at our church building. Um, we ask you to consider these passages, as Kay and I do, of the, hus the wife submitting to the husband, and the husband loving the wife, and, and finding the, the beauty in that relationship instead of just living and functioning, and maybe not realizing what all God has for us. So have a blessed afternoon as we sing. Um, I know there may be potential for conflict in our congregation, being that the Chiefs are playing the Steelers today. And, you know, I just, I just know the grace of God is certainly big enough for that. And then for a guy like me who was a Steelers fan growing up and living in Kansas, I'm, I'm just going to be torn either way. So anyway, have a great afternoon. Let's sing together the blessing.
know the Lord is turning his face towards you, I just ask you to accept the peace he has for you. In whatever situation you're finding yourself in this morning, let's sing together. to you this morning. We'll see you all, Lord willing, uh, next week in our, our church building, and we pray that those who are ill will be getting better. And we just want to thank the Lord for what He's doing in our lives, even in this kind of strange time right now. So, we'll say goodbye to you now. So, bye.